Margot Roberts with Alta Planning and Design, and we're here talking about pedestrian safety campaigns that don't suck. You can read between the lines and see what I think of many pedestrian safety campaigns. Uh, this was a campaign we did for the city of Eureka, California, and um, we started by making them, inviting them to be very clear about defining the problem. So a message like share the road or be safe isn't clear enough about what I want you to do differently compared to what you're doing today. So we started by identifying the specific behaviors for that we wanted changed. And then everything we did was very clearly oriented around that. And you can see, I mean, we say expect people in crosswalks. That's actually not the like smoothest phrase, but we decided it was more important to be crystal clear about what we wanted than perhaps having a mellifluous phrase that was not very meaningful. We also chose to make it physically very, very bright, uh, especially as in our communities, it's sort of an overcast coastal area, and so the pop of color was on purpose, and um, we made ourselves impossible to miss, physically ubiquitous, um, through uh, online media, uh, print ads, um, outdoor media, but also lots of like posters in storefront windows. We gave out so many uh, coffee sleeves to downtown coffee shops. They're happy not to pay for those. And then everyone's walking around with a bright yellow coffee mug. Um, we went to, uh, you can see, a, a lot of community events and had some sort of fun games that people could play and they could win the bright tote bags, but always through engaging them about behavior and about the importance of, of changing their own behavior. And then we also evaluated the campaign, um, and I would be happy to share with anyone, it's on the Alta website, altaplanning.com. If you search for Eureka, you can find the final report. But we felt it was important to be honest and transparent about whether the campaign worked. Um, and we did end up receiving really, really positive uh, feedback from community members about, had they knew about the campaign, they understood what it was about, they agreed that it was important, and they thought it was good that the city was investing in, in keeping the streets safer. Surprises, takeaways, unexpected things? I don't know that this was unexpected, but it was very helpful and gratifying that um, the whole community really got behind it. So uh, this is our, was our press conference. Um, I think we had over 25 people attending. The mayor gave a speech, the police chief gave a speech, city council members, members of the advisory committee. Uh, they were all putting things on Facebook throughout the campaign. And we had a wonderful crew of uh, pedestrians uh, with the traffic um, committee, safety committee. I forget the exact name. They all came out and helped us table. So I think that um, it extended the reach, but it also showed that it was not a consultant-led effort, it was a community-led effort, and that they owned it. So, not a surprise, but it, it made a huge difference. again? Jessica Roberts with Alta Planning and Design. Okay, uh, my name is Suresha Kuturi. I am a researcher from Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. And uh, this is a work done by my, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Chris Monsier, Dr. Miguel Figliozzi, um, Ali uh, Razumba, and uh, Dan Hazel. And uh, the objective of this study was to uh, estimate the safety effectiveness of pedestrian crossing enhancements in Oregon. And we also wanted to derive the crash modification factors that were uh, calibrated to Oregon design context. So we mounted an extensive data collection, collected a lot of crossing and crash data, and tried to get at this notion of, like, you know, especially for the rectangular rapid uh, flashing beacons, can we uh, understand what the impacts are on pedestrian and rear end crashes? So we went through an extensive uh, data analysis and model building exercise and found some uh, preliminary evidence of uh, uh, CMFs that show that uh, the RRFBs were uh, successful in reducing pedestrian crashes, uh, but also caused an increase in the rear end crashes. But um, this this uh, study, you know, as other studies do, has a lot of limitations in that there was not enough, we feel like, crash data or uh, the number of years. And so 
uh, while these findings are exciting, I think we definitely need more research uh, in order to validate and confirm these results. You looked at RRFBs. Yeah, what's that? You looked at the RRFBs. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And how effective did you find those? So we found that they uh, contributed about 22% reduction in pedestrian crashes and uh, we did find some evidence of increased uh, rear-end crashes with the RRFBs, uh, but uh, but again, you know, that's there's limit there's limited data and things. So we definitely it's the results are promising and they are similar to what other studies have found. So what are some of the most effective countermeasures for traffic crashes for pedestrians? So we've looked at three, um, the rectangular rapid uh, flashing beacons, uh, we've looked at high visibility crosswalk markings and the flashing amber beacons. Uh, these are the three we've looked at, but there, there's tons of others in the literature. It totally depends on the context and, and you know each individual intersection or whether it's a mid-block crossing. So, yeah. Thank you. Sarisha Kuturi from Portland, Oregon. Teresa Peterson with Fair and Fierce. Uh, this is a poster I created as a part of a project with the city of Oakland. We created a policy for treating pedestrians at signalized intersections. And we interviewed a bunch of cities about their potential treatments that they use at signalized intersections to come up with rules of thumb. And then we figured out how they would be implemented in Oakland through these series of flowcharts that use different thresholds and intersection characteristics to figure out what should be installed to uh, treat pedestrians better at signals. Oh, sorry? Walk through it? Okay. So this is an actuated signal flowchart, figuring out what's the best location to install uh, pedestrian recall at intersections. Um, this is showing you what kind of treatments you can install at uh, signals if you have a lot of left turn conflicts with pedestrians. Um, so the treatments here are on the bottom that you can reach depending on the characteristics of the intersection. Similarly here with right turn conflicts, you can install leading pedestrian interval, um, protected turns, and then here is kind of a test for when you should install a pedestrian scramble. Here's some sample photos. So what you learn? Uh, we learned a bunch. We learned rules of thumbs that other cities are working on, and we learned that the city of Oakland is kind of the first one to come up with this policy that is telling you exactly what you should implement at an intersection based on these type of characteristics. Thanks. I'm Tara Goddard. I'm a PhD candidate at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. So this is part of my dissertation work, which is ongoing, so these are just preliminary results. Please keep that in mind. Uh, but I'm very interested in bicycle safety from the standpoint of understanding drivers' attitudes and behaviors. Because, as we know, bicycling is disproportionately unsafe as a mode compared to the amount of people doing it, but that doesn't come from bicycling as a mode itself, but from interactions with drivers. And so not that many studies have looked into drivers' attitudes and behaviors around bicycles. So what I did is I created a two-part online survey where I put first the people who responded saw an implicit association test, which is a very common uh, way in psychology of testing people's implicit biases. And it's been used in everything from racism and sexism and ageism and political bias. Um, but nobody has looked at it between roadway users, bias between roadway users. So the first thing they do is they, they signed on and they got this test and they saw these, uh, st this type of silhouette image and also the words driver and bicyclist and they had to sort that with good and bad words. Uh, like, I mean literally like good, pleasant, etc. Not, not curse words. And then, then they got this explicit survey. So I ended up with 676 people that completed my survey. It was about two-thirds women which is very common in survey research. Women are just better at answering surveys, frankly. Um, and I was targeting drivers, and I was successful in getting people who drive a lot. So if you look at the 60%, almost my drivers drive seven days a week, which is even more than I expected. Um, and then these are counties where I have at least one response. So it was nationwide, I got a pretty good distribution. So I'll be able to look at when I get further along, 
how some of their attitudes and behaviors are influenced or by where they are. So we know there's different world cultures and different communities and different regions. Uh, so I'll be able to look at that and I just haven't had time yet. But this is, I asked people, have you bicycled outside in the previous year? And I said outside because I didn't want to be a you know, spin class or something. 54% said yes, which actually surprised me. That was quite a bit more than I thought. Um, and then, but of those people who said yes, I then asked them, okay, well in a typical week with nice weather, how many days a week do you bicycle? And almost half said no. So they're, they bicycled, maybe vacation, maybe exercise, maybe an open streets event, but not regularly. So keep, you gotta keep that in mind. And then here were the results. It was pretty normally distributed on my, whether they were kind of biased one way or the other, although it was still more for drivers. So then what I did is I took that, those test results, and I compared that to this question. I asked people, is, do you agree, disagree, being a driver is an important part of who you are? And there was an almost perfect correlation of people who had this implicit bias towards driving, who said, I strongly agree that driving is an important part of I am. Or if they said, I strongly disagree, they had this preference for bicyclists. That might seem obvious, <laughs> however, it showed me that this implicit test, which hadn't been used in this way, is measuring what I was hoping it would measure. So that was exciting to me. So then what I did is I looked at that implicit bias and I looked at it by these bicycling levels. So if they bicycled outside in the last year, it was pretty evenly split on this preference. And if they had not, much stronger preference for driving. But then when I asked those people again who'd bicycled outside and whether they bicycling, if they bicycled one day or more, they had this better attitude towards bicyclists. If they didn't, it was, it was exactly like the pattern of people who hadn't bicycled at all. So to me that says, you know, it's not enough necessarily to get people on a bike once a year or once or twice a year. It's like these more frequent little, doesn't mean you have to be a five day a week commuter, but you know, maybe on a bike share and on a weekly lunch trip or whatever it is. This is a little bit different, switching gears, I, no pun intended. Um, I showed people these uh, silhouettes of different bicycles because I wanted to test whether drivers differentiate between different types of bicyclists. And this is building on work like Ian Walker in the UK did where he looked at whether drivers pass differently, if the bicyclist is female or not, helmet or not. I didn't give them these terms. These are my terms for, for purposes. And I said, these are a feeling thermometer, which is really common in psychology. And I just said, from extremely cold to extremely warm, how do you feel about this this bicyclist. Nobody said extremely cold, which is nice, but most, a big part of my sample were cold, but they do differentiate because they felt equally cold pretty much about the what I call the roadie and the fixie, but the casual was less. So again, this speaks to, well, let's not just push everyone to wear spandex and wear the helmet, but actually drivers are more positive and may behave better. We don't know, that's the next steps to look at towards people who look more like every day. And we definitely have good evidence that people, when they, if they see people bicycling like this, they're like, oh, that person looks like me. Like, I don't look like this person, but I, I do look like this person. So, so, that's what this one is. Then, I wanted to look at the special case of overtaking, which of course is a lot of interest, partly because that's the most commonly fatal crash, is when a bicyclist gets hit behind. But also things like the three foot passing laws or the meter matters in other countries. And so I asked people, do you agree, disagree, you're a skilled driver? No shock, almost everyone says they're a skilled driver. But they were willing to admit, 40% were willing to say, and did say, uh, and believe that they're not comfortable necessarily deciding how fast or close, right? So we, it raises the question, how do people even know how to pass a bicycle? We're spending a lot of time talking about their, you know, their need to do it better but they don't necessarily know. And the example I give is maybe you're on your bike and you feel like a car just buzzed you and you're like, what the heck, that person's a jerk. But in the, the driver may be thinking, oh, I'm gonna do that person a favor and I know this is uncomfortable for them, so I'm gonna get it over with really fast. So they just go zooming by and it's a totally different experience of the same situation, right? And then I also ask them, because again, these passing laws, are you actually even able to judge how far away you are? And 40, almost half my people said, I actually find it difficult to judge how far away I am from myself, which makes sense. We have big vehicles, you're often passing someone who's on your, you know, the other side of your passenger side. Then I asked them about this, because I think this is something we haven't asked nearly about or we don't well understand. So again, this is the same data, I'm a skilled driver. But then I asked them about, do you agree, disagree, does it make you nervous to drive next to a bicycle? So I think anecdotally we hear that a lot. 
77% said it makes me nervous to drive next to a personal bicyclist. What I don't know yet, because I haven't been able to look deeper into the data, is that because they think bicycles are, un are unpredictable, they're going to dash on the road, maybe they're just very and appropriately aware of their ability to cause that person harm. We don't know, but this is a big thing. Same as this, it's the startle thing with like the opposite side bike lane coming up on the left side. Because we do know that when people are startled or afraid or nervous, they can make, say, motor skill errors. And so when you're operating a vehicle at speed, you know, like a very small error has a very big consequence. So I think this is why this is important to ask about this. And then finally, still with the overtaking, is this question of pressure to pass. So 83% of my sample said that if they don't pass a bicyclist who's like, you know, kind of holding up traffic, other drivers get annoyed. And it's such a deep cultural thing in our country, thou shall not hold up traffic, right? And so this is really important that I think that if we have to change this pressure to pass, otherwise people, even if they know it's unsafe, even if they know they're not very good judge of how far away the bicycle is, they're gonna do it anyways because this is so strong. So these are all, again, preliminary results. My next steps will be multivariate analysis and looking at things like area, demographics, experience, and how those in a whole, when you control for them, how are they predicting some of these self-report behaviors and then their own bicycling behaviors or whatever. But next step, stay tuned. You can find me here. Yeah. Affiliation again? Portland State University. I'm a PhD candidate. And Tara Goddard. Sorry, I just bear with your name and where you're from. Jamie Kraminski from Orlando, Florida. Yeah, HDR engineering. Can you tell me about what you're studying, what you've learned? Well, basically, what, we, what we've been working on is a methodology to help select an appropriate bike facility um, for a given street, you know, based on the context of the street, the, uh, the physical characteristics and traffic characteristics of the street. Uh, because there's a lot of choices on what type of, of bike facility you can use with, you know, some of the, the um, you know, all, all the rage with, like, you know, the uh, separated bikeways and, you know, there's, there's a whole menu of different treatment options. And so it's not always clear what's the best option for a specific roadway. So this process helps us to make a determination on what facility is best suited for a particular street and we can then document what that is and then show justification for how we got to that decision point. What are some kind of quick highlights of what that, that process is? I mean, it doesn't seem completely intuitive, so. Okay, so we start with, you can see on the, on the far side over there, um, we have an initial chart which basically, um, based on speed and volume um, data from a street, uh, puts you into one of three different tracks, either a uh, basically like a shared environment track, a lanes and markings track, or a separated facilities track. And then from then, that point, you go into the flow chart, and there's all these different questions, decision points, uh, where we can set thresholds based on community preferences, but that guides you through to what is a specific um, treatment at the end. And this particular chart, it's it's always trying to kind of kick you down to a greater level of protection. So you start, if you know, you can start at the you know up here, but you may end up down here. So and then there are some places where even like a separated facility, if you've got a lot of driveways or other conflict points or um, you know limited space, there may be you know enough reasons to not do one of those, and so you may end up with a a street where without doing something much more radical there's not a, a good fit for a particular facility so it may be that you have to look for a parallel corridor or something along those lines. So speed, volume, and driveways seem to be a lot of... Dri them. Driveways is certainly, uh, you know, that's a concern for, you know, when you talk about uh, side paths or uh, separated bikeways. You're welcome. David. My name is Don Cross. I'm the uh, school safety coordinator for the city of Phoenix, uh, Street Transportation Department. Uh, we're here talking about um, how school siting affects mobility. Um, we did a report with ITE uh, that talks about siting issues 
and also uh, uh, best practices for improving traffic flow and uh, parking issues and how to encourage more walking and biking to school. What's that? What are your, what are your findings? Oh, okay, so uh, here's an example. Uh, this would be a neighborhood that would be ideal. You would want your school to be right in the middle. Uh, that way you have uh, access from all sides to get to the campus. If you have an example like this, where the school is here, and the only way to get there is really driving. So here's an example of the end of the queuing lane, and it wraps all the way around. Uh, so you're talking about a half mile by half mile stretch. Um, so the amount of traffic you're talking about is huge. Um, so not having a situation where you're, let's say, rural or out of the way, out of the neighborhood, and having something more dense, you know, in the middle of the neighborhood should be your goal. Smaller schools should be a goal. Even though people tend to build bigger schools nowadays, um, you get, you know, school districts that get free land, cheap land. You know, they're going to build, as long as it's in their boundaries, they're going to use that space because they have to save money. It's all about economics. And, you know, school uh, mobility is kind of last on their list. So we're trying to bring that idea back that if you site the school the right way, then you're going to have better results as far as walking and biking. Uh, Don Cross, City Fix. Thank you.